Welcome to the AV1611 Hour. My name is Nelson Turner, and this broadcast is dedicated to the King James Bible, the Word of God in the English language for the end-time English-speaking peoples of the earth. Proverbs 11, verse 1 in your King James Bible. A just weight. God likes to see justice. He likes to see something that's just, something that's accurate, something that's exactly what it shows itself to be. So Proverbs 11.1, 1, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. Now, this speaks specifically to weights and measures. A false balance. You see, the men in the temple in the time of Jesus had false weights and false measures. The money changers weren't exchanging money in a manner that was pleasing to God. They actually were shortchanging the people. And so this primarily applies to monetary affairs, but yet this verse applies to the whole realm of human activity in life. A false balance is an abomination of the Lord. See, we need to have a balanced life as a Christian. We need to do all the Word of God and not some of the Word of God. A just weight is what God delights in. A perfect balance, a weight that is accurate, that is righteous, that is true. Uh, because if you're given a false weight or a false measure, and that's what the world gives the church, and that's what the world gives itself, they hold up a false measure that you were to judge yourself by. They hold up the measure of a Hollywood movie star as the example of a good man and that you were to conform yourself to him. They hold up the example of some vile, filthy sow as being a virtuous woman. And then they tell the world that they are to conform themselves to this woman. They say, oh, isn't he a wonderful man? about our president, or about some of these legislators or judges, when really they are dirty, vile, wicked sinners. Our standard must be the Lord Jesus Christ. Our standard is the Bible. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Bible. Now, I want to apply this verse, Proverbs 11.1, 1, to the Bible itself, to the words of God. Um, Deuteronomy 12.32. And there are many, many times in the Word of God where we're admonished to do everything in the Word of God, to follow all the Word of God, to take heed unto every word. Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what the Lord Jesus quoted in Matthew 4 to the devil. We need to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Not just some of the words that proceeded out of the mouth of God, but all of the words. And we're going to get into actually two kinds of sin, which I will... Um, delineate in two subsections a ways of committing sin against the Word of God. Now Deuteronomy 12, verse 32, the last verse in this chapter. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. The Jew, the Israelite, the Hebrew was told, whatever I told you to do, observe to do it. Not part of it, but all of it. Observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, and also, nor diminish from it. You don't add to what God said, nor do you diminish it or belittle it or make it smaller. These are the two primary sins that lead to all other sins. And of course, these sins are committed through pride. See, um, thou shalt not add thereto. Through pride, Romanism, the Council of Trent, and vain and sinful men, think they can add to the Bible something else is necessary unto salvation. That's through pride that men add to the Bible. They add to what is necessary unto salvation. And it's through pride that they think that they can cut certain parts of the Bible out. They think they can do away with some of the words. And they think they can do away with some of the practice that is demanded. These are the primary sins that all other sins bleed into. See, God demands many, many things. Um, the Bible says in Psalm 119, Thy commandment is exceeding broad. Uh, the old Negro spiritual, so high you can't get over it, so low you can't go under it, so wide you can't get around it. The Word of God, the law of God, the statutes, the testimonies, the gospel of Christ is exceeding broad. It encompasses all actions, activities, thoughts, and deeds in life. There is no point of human existence to where the law of God, the Word of God, does not extend. We cannot find anything in our daily lives to where the Bible does not have something to say about how and what should be done. You cannot find a single thing in human existence that is not regulated by the Word of God. 
Now, men would have it not be so, because men, being desirous to exercise their depraved free will, they seek to say, well, I can do this and thus, even though the Word says this. See, in other words, I can do something contrary to the Word, and it's okay. They broaden the commandment to sanction sin. Nowhere in either testament does the Word of God sanction sin. But God warned these Jews, and He warns us today, that whatsoever thing He commands us, observe to do it. Watch on to prayer. Observe to do what He said. Don't let the Word of God slip. And He tells us, Thou shalt not add thereto. You don't take the commandment of God and say, Yes, we have the commandment of God. And of course, for us to be ministers according to the commandment of God, we have to shave all facial hair. Almost every major Christian university in the United States does that. There is no thing like that in the Bible. That precept of man, that commandment of man, disqualifies Elijah. It disqualifies John Baptist. It disqualifies Aaron and every priest and Levite. Right. Those stinking fools. Okay? They add to, a man can't be divorced and remarried or he cannot preach. They disqualify men that God told to preach by saying that. It's an extra-biblical commandment. You see, it's extra-biblical laws. They add to. That's one way of adding to the Word of God. The other way, of course, is to actually add words and say they're God's words when they're not. And I'm going to cover both of these. Nor diminish from it. Okay, well, you don't have to do this and this and that, even though it's in the New Testament. You don't have to be holy. You don't have to be pure. Why, some preachers preach that once you're saved, you don't have to confess your sin. They do. They say when, when you're saved, you're forgiven, and you're eternally forgiven. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, there's another uh, passage in Deuteronomy, like unto this first one, in Deuteronomy 4, verses 1 and 2. I want to cite that. And then go down further and see in the breadth of the Word of God that we are told again and again and again not to add to the Word of God and not to diminish it one little bit. One jot, one tittle, or as it is in the Greek, I believe, iota. Not at all. You don't take the smallest precept, the smallest participle. You don't take one word, one sentence, one paragraph, one chapter out of the Bible. Now, of course, Romanism has added many chapters and many books to the Bible that are not of the Bible. Not only do they do that, see, they, they add to the Word of God literally, but they add to it as well in practice by adding extra-biblical things that are non-canonical and saying you must do them. You must be in submission to the hierarchy. You must be a gelding who's whipped by your wife. You must worship Mary. You must keep Christ Mass and, and Monday Tuesday or Monday Thursday and, and Shrove Tuesday and all these holidays. None of these things are... They're not holidays. They call them holy days, I guess, but they're not in the Bible. Now, um, Deuteronomy 4.1, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments. We, as the people of God, as made not unto the commonwealth of Israel, are to hearken. We're to hear and to listen, not only with our ears, but with our hearts. We're to be attentive hearers to the Word of God. We're to take the Word of God seriously as life and death itself, because it is as serious as life and death itself. It determines life and death. So, now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live. When you do what God says, you have life, and that more abundantly. When you won't do what God says, you bring death onto yourself, spiritual and physical. So, do the ju unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. If you do the word of God, you will have something spiritual, and you will have something physical. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you. You're to add nothing to the Bible. Look, I had a Pentecostal woman tell me one time when I had my big old mustache. She said, I grew a mustache. I was working in a place and I was clean shaved when I started there. I grew my big old mustache. She said, that's of the devil. You have become evil. Yes, the hair that God caused to grow on my face made me evil. You see, a commandment of man. And I'm using that as a kind of a linchpin throughout this sermon, this idea of clean-shaved or not clean-shaved. Why, these Mennonites, you must have a beard, but you must shave your upper lip or you're not a holy man. It's, it's absurd. They add on to the Word of God, but he said, Ye shall not add on to the Word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. You don't take anything from it. You leave it and observe it in its entirety, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. 
when you add to the Word of God or you diminish something from it, you're not keeping the commandments. You're not obeying Jesus. You're not walking in the Spirit. Proverbs 30. The inspired author, Solomon, records the same thing. This is... uh, Actually, these, these may be actually the words of David here. That's open to debate. But every word of God is pure, verse 5. First of all, if it's not pure, it's not the word of God. That's right. If it's not pure, it's not the word of God. Now look, again, there's something else hidden, but in plain view in this verse. Every word of God is pure, and then the word of God is called he. The word of God, small w, is called he. Did you ever see that before? The Bible is alive. The Bible's name is Jesus Christ. See, they're one and the same in the Scriptures. Every word of God is pure. He, meaning God, but the word of God is what's spoken of there. The word that proceeds forth from God is as God Himself on the earth. And disobedience to the word is disobedience to God. Therefore, to give Jesus Christ the preeminence, the Bible must have the preeminence. Every word of God is pure. He, meaning God, but meaning the Word of God, is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. When I put my trust and my faith in the A.V. 1611, I am putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I exhibit faith and trust in the A.V. 1611 by submitting to the commands that are in there and obeying them and not departing from them. I express a love to God by keeping His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. I remember a man told me, oh... I said, how are you doing? This guy was a professing brother. I said, Hi. oh, you know, don't do this, don't do that. I'm trying real hard. I said, that's funny because the Bible said his commandments are not grievous. Oh, I don't mean they're grievous. He said, yeah, you did. You just complained about it. You didn't like the do's and the don'ts. You didn't like the thou shalt nots. You wanted a lot less thou shalt nots and a lot more do whatsoever thou wilt for that is the whole of the law. You wanted the satanic Bible instead of God's word. See, every word of God is pure. He is a shield on them that put their trust in Him. What can you add to Jesus Christ? What can you add to perfection? What can you add to the beauty of holiness that God gives? Nothing. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. You know, in the Bible, back in Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis 2, the first sin committed by a human being was not the sin of Adam, but the sin of his wife. And what she did was she sought to teach the devil doctrine. And when a woman seeks to teach the devil doctrine, she never succeeds. She will always fail, and the devil will teach her doctrine instead. She must have somebody between her and the devil, namely a man, so that the man can filter whatever the devil's putting at her and stop up all the lies that would come at her. See, she was uncovered. She was not covered by her husband in this instant. Genesis 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. First observe that the devil colors the word of God to emphasize the negative instead of the positive. Instead of showing the woman everything that God said she could have, he says, God told you you couldn't have anything. The way of the Lord is exceeding narrow and it's just so terrible and hard. Do you really want to do that? That's the emphasis he places on the Bible. When he uses the Bible, it's to show you what you can have instead of what you have. So, yea, hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, look, back there, In verse 16 of Genesis 2, God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. He was allowed to eat of every tree of the garden except one. Verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So the devil brings doubt as to the veracity or truthfulness of the word of God, and he rests the word of God. He twists it to make it say something it didn't say. He perverts and corrupts the words of the living God. This has always been the devil's work and will always be his work. Now the woman said on the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. She had that part right. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. She lied. She added to the word of God, Neither shall ye touch it. That's not recorded in Genesis 2. So she added to the word of God. You know what that resulted in? That resulted in death for you and I and every man and woman that's ever lived. It resulted in death in our members. It resulted in original sin. It resulted in a 
innate desire in the natural man to gainsay, resist, add to, and diminish from the Word of God. And it's been passed down to all of Adam's corrupt seed. Because they are all corrupt. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So you have the proclivity within you to do that in your natural man. You want to add to the Word of God things that are easy for you to do and that you like to do. But you want to diminish from the Word of God those things that are unpleasant, that are not as good for you in your flesh. You want to take away from the Word of God the hard sayings, the hard things, and leave the nice things. And that's a false balance, which is an abomination to the Lord. Most preachers that are preaching right now in America, they are an abomination to the Lord because they preach a false balance. We must cleave to the Word of God and always strive to have a true balance, a just weight and a just measure. Now, that's in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. I demonstrated the principle laid out in Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 12, that you should not add to the words of God, and also in Proverbs, and that you should not diminish aught from the word of God. The Bible begins with a woman, the story of man begins with a woman adding to the word of God, seeking to minister to the devil. You should never seek to minister to the devil or devils. It's a waste of time. They cannot be reformed. They cannot be converted. Christ did not die for angels. He died for sinful men. So there's no point seeking the redemption of the devil or people that are basically devils themselves. Oh, that's awful. There's no love. I have no love for the devil. Why should I? Does the Bible command me to love the devil or to love the brethren? Oh, no man, man, anything. It didn't say, oh, no devil, anything but to love him. Oh, no man, anything but to love him. No, we're in Revelation 22, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. The whole Bible is prophecy one way or another. It's all prophetic. There are shadows and types which are prophetic in their uh, teachings. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. When you add unto God's word, you bring plagues upon yourself. So we see in the book of Revelation that the whore of Babylon, the Roman church, has plagues poured out on her. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. There's an Arminian proof text to prove you can lose it. But that's indeed not what it is. God will kill you if you do that. And you won't have any part in the things to come. And it's already actually ordained of old according to Jude 4. Now, Paul said of these matters in 2 Corinthians 2.17, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Paul said, I'm pointing out the difference between me and them. I'm going to point out what I believe, what I profess, and what they profess. We're not like them. We don't make the word of God rotten by adding to it or subtracting from it, and we don't make the Word of God rotten by subverting or perverting it in practice. Those are the two ways men corrupt the Word of God. One, by diminishing the Word, by removal of words, by the literal effacing of words in here. So, 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil. And the New King James reads, All sorts or all kinds of evil. No, all All evil. The love of money can be tied to every sin that you want to commit today. Every sin that you're tempted in your mind right now and will be all this week, one way or another, the love of money can be attached somehow to that. You say, but I can't figure that out. Okay, how about lust of the eyes? You wouldn't have a problem with that if evil underwear sellers wouldn't have renamed their underwear bikini. You wouldn't have had a problem with that if men hadn't perverted the meaning of nakedness to make money in movies and showing men's bare chests. That's nakedness. A man with a bare chest is naked according to the Bible. It's very plain. See, all corruption feeds lust, and gratifying lust will cause money to be spent, money to be earned, money to be gained. Men will do all sorts of things. They even pray so that they might consume themselves with their own lusts. You see, men will do all sorts of things to achieve their desires, but those that facilitate them achieving unlawful, wicked, lascivious desires invariably gain great wealth. That's why Rome is so wealthy. 
That's, they, they sold indulgences that men might commit adultery. They sold indulgences that men might murder and then go free. They made the law of God of none effect by their tradition. And the Protestant pastors today are doing the same thing. They diminish the word of God by removal of words. Why, any pastor that uses any other Bible than an AB 1611 in English is guilty of this. He's telling people that he has the word of God when he doesn't. He's preaching a book that is full of errors and lies that's not God's word. He professes to have something he doesn't, and he diminishes God's commandments. Now, he says we are to love God, and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. but he says it in the opposite order. He says we're to love our neighbor first and God second. That's what they do in practice. You see, all these different things are perversions and corruptions, but number one, the way to corrupt the word of God is to diminish the word by removal of words. Now, the natural tendency is if you have to copy something over and over again, is to skip words or miss words. It's not to add words, it's to skip. And so God kept in check the natural depravity and corruption of the scribes and of the copyists. And what he did was he jumped over man's depravity all the way down to the present time and preserved the whole Bible, the whole Word of God, collated in one book in its entirety in the King James. And in Martin Luther's Heilige Schriftica, and in the New Testament, in the Textus Receptus, and in the Old Testament in the Masoretic Text. He jumped over the depravity of 50 or 60 generations of sinners and made sure that every word he wanted in here was here. That's right. Now, if you think that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is something, and it is something. Isn't that something too? Amen. To me, they're one and the same. If, God, if God's able to raise the dead, He can preserve His word. Amen. So men have an innate desire to diminish or remove something from the word of God. And they have an innate desire to add men's words to God's word and hold men's word in equal authority with God's word. Jeremiah 23. I haven't preached on this topic in a while. And verse 33, no, we'll read verse 36 and down. I'll start there. And the burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. There's a very great truth taught in those few words. Man's word is a burden to men. God's word gives us a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. Uh, Man's word is a yoke grievous and heavy to be borne. And those that are heavy laden are laden with precepts and commandments of men. For every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. They perverted the words of God. Spiritual perverts create perversion. That's what they do. That's how they breed, by infecting others with their perversion. This is why the death penalty is leveled against sodomy in the Old Testament. It stops the plague at its source. If you Look, it's very simple. If every sodomite was executed the first time they committed an act of sodomy, there wouldn't be any sodomites, would there? They'd be eradicated from the land. But that's not what men do because, after all, they believe they're to love sinners and they're to pray for sinners and they're to just esteem sinners just as good as Christ himself. That's what they've been taught and that's what they do. So... Verse 37, Thus shalt thou say to the prophet, What hath the Lord answered thee, and what hath the Lord spoken? But since ye say the burden of the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord, because ye say this word, the burden of the Lord, and I have sent unto you, saying, Ye shall not say the burden of the Lord, therefore behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you, and I will forsake you, and the city that I gave you and your fathers, and cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you. It's everlasting on the Jew. For eternity, the Bible is going to exist. And the record of his apostasy will exist for eternity. It's an everlasting reproach. It doesn't mean they're wiped out everlastingly in every generation. But there's an everlasting shame and reproach upon the nation of Israel for having been given the lively oracles and then refusing to walk therein. So, you see, God cast men out of his presence when they say the burden of the Lord and he didn't send them. When they say God hath said and God didn't say. There's a curse on people that do that. This whole nation is cursed. Now, the first way I showed, there's only two ways to corrupt the Word of God that I know. One is in, barely, by the bare words, taking them and removing them or adding to them. The second way is in practice. 
Now, it's to diminish the word by failing to observe to do all that is commanded. I'll give you a few examples in the Bible over in 1 Samuel 15. Now, here's a man that thought he kept the word of the Lord, Saul. He was anointed. He was the chosen king. And he was given a commission. Now, his commission was a commission that not a single pastor that I know of practically in this whole nation would fulfill. Look, if God told you, arise, go and kill those people, and it was God talking through God's man, and you know it was God's man, you'd be beholden to obey, right? Well, I don't know about that, brother. I might get hurt. You might get hurt if you don't obey. Now, this is what the word was to him. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, verse 2, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. If everything in this room is burned up with fire, if all things in this room are burned up with fire, what would be left? Come on, let's reason together. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So, Saul is to go and to destroy all that they have and spare them not. And in case he's getting a little squeamish, in case he's getting a little uneasy, he's told, but slay both man and woman without distinction. Infant and suckling. Notice the distinction? The suckling and then the one that is weaned from the breast, the infant. Ox and sheep, camel and ass. You're not even to take the trucks and the cars. You're to burn it all and destroy it all. Kill everything that breathes. Keep nothing. So Saul gathered the people together, numbered them. And he had 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. He had an army of 210,000 men. So he had plenty of men to do this job. There was no lack of manpower. And Saul came to a city of the Amalek and laid wait in the valley. He told the Kenites, get out. And um, then Saul smote Amalek, verse 7, from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. He smote the whole land. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalek, Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep. They're not fulfilling the word of God. They're to kill those animals. They're to slay them and burn them with fire. They're not even to eat them things. Of the oxen, of the fatlings, and the lambs, all that was good. Now, God said those people were sinners, and everything that they have and is tainted with curses and is a curse. It's an accursed thing. You're to have nothing to do with it. But people say, well, God doesn't know what he's talking about. And after all, those are some fine beasts. And they'd make beautiful sacrifices unto the Lord. So they would not destroy all that was good, and they would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. That's the way the modern church in America is. See, that, oh, well, it's terrible. We'll preach against this and we'll preach against that. But our little sins of carnality and worldliness and uh, our, our little prancing around and being effeminate, all, all this junk they do. See, they say, well, this is okay. God understands this, but not that. See, these pastors, well, I've never been drunk in my life. I've only been with my wife my whole life. I'm a good man. Never mind that he uses an NIV. You see, that's vile and dirty in the spiritual sense. In a way, sins of the flesh can never be. And he refused to destroy everything. And then what happens? Samuel said to Saul, and Saul said unto him, verse 13, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He didn't do what God said, and then he turns around and says he did. It's like so many people I know, you know. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, Now here he's going to justify himself instead of God. You either justify God by your behavior or yourself, one of the two. They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now, Samuel in verse 18 repeats the message to Saul, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them till they be consumed. But they fell upon the spoil. And then this great truth is laid out in 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord is great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Does he delight in big buildings and multitudes of sinners lined up on padded pews with fat wallets? singing the praises of some man? No, he doesn't. 
Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. What Saul did is called rebellion. And it says, witchcraft and his stubbornness is idolatry. There it is. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. When you add to the word of God, or take from, or diminish aught from the word of God, you reject the word of the Lord, then God will reject you in your service. Temporally here now as a Christian. Not eternally. See, this is a lost, hell-bound reprobate here. His whole life was vanity and sin. He in his best state was altogether vanity. He did nothing right by the Spirit of God one time, though he prophesied by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God came on him, but he got no reward for that. He didn't diligently seek the Lord. He was not one of the Lord's own people. He was a reprobate. And what got him in trouble was adding to the Word of God by putting his own opinions and the opinions of the people in equal authority with the commandment of God. And so he didn't execute the Word of the Lord. So men corrupt God's Word in failing to obey that which has been commanded. By, and another way they do it, see this is what's called partial obedience. He partially obeyed. We're to fully obey all that the Lord our God hath commanded us. Now Matthew 23, 23. We'll give an example in the New Testament of the Pharisees who diminished from the Word. They not only added the washing of cups and bowls and brazen vessels and many other such things which were not commanded particularly at all times in the Old Testament. They added to the Word of God, but they also diminished from it by elevating some duties above others. This is the common sin of the Christians today. They elevate certain duties as of all and paramount importance and let the rest go. This is the accusation the Lord Jesus Christ puts upon them, and rightly so, in Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. They're very persnickety or peculiar about monetary manners and about the letter of the law when it comes to money. But they've omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. You're supposed to do it all. He said, you do it all. Not part of it, all of it. It's not good enough. We say, but I can't measure up. That's why Christ died. Well, I can't do it. That's why Christ rose again, because He can. And Christ, who is our life, shall appear will appear with Him in glory. But in the meantime, it is His Spirit that works in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. Now, all through the New Testament, there are commandments for New Testament Christianity, for our behavior and how we ought to live and what we ought to do. We're not to leave any of these things undone. See, Titus 2.11, down through the end of the chapter... For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now the grace of God doesn't teach us to just do a little bit and let the rest go. The grace of God does not teach us to add carnal ordinances and commandments which are easy for us to keep to the worship of God. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that what? What does the true grace of the living God teach? Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We don't walk in this. We deny it. Denying ungodliness. Well, what is ungodliness? You don't have the Spirit of God in you? You don't know. You must have the Spirit within you to know. And the Spirit bears witness to the text of the King James and shows you what is ungodly, what is holy, what is profane, what is clean and what is unclean. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live. Now it tells us how we should live. Does it tell us that I should be a Christian comedian and tell you jokes and humorous stories while I'm in the pulpit and make you laugh and feel good? No. How are you supposed to live? All of us. Soberly. Not drunken. That's in opposition to being drunken with wine, but that's in opposition to being frivolous, light, and treacherous in your demeanor and behavior. Live soberly. That means to be grave. You know what a grave is? It's a hole in the ground where you're going to go. Your demeanor is to be grave. You're to be serious-minded. You're to live righteously, not unrighteously. You're to live right, not wrong. And godly. You're to give off 
the impression outwardly to the world that in fact you are attached to God, that you have the Spirit of God in you and you're in obedience to the Word of God. Not by an imitation of Christ, but rather by the very substance of Christ being in your being and being manifest in your mortal body. We're to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. We're to be looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who gave himself for us, particular redemption, that he might redeem us, particular redemption, from all iniquity. He died to deliver you from all sin, not some sins. So how can you say, let us sin that the grace of God may abound? No. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify in himself a peculiar people, zealous of what? Good works. First Thessalonians 4. And First and Second Thessalonians have all kinds of instructions about church order and how a Christian is to live. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1. Furthermore, then, we beseech you. We're beseeching you. We're begging you. We're imploring you, Paul says, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, by the one whom you've been saved by, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would do, so ye would abound more and more. He said, you've received of us. We preached to you how you're supposed to live. Now you are to do it more and more. Instead of a standing still, there is to be an increase in godliness, an increase in sanctification, an increase in righteousness. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. That just does not include a physical act, but all fornication with worldly things with worldly ways, with worldly desires. That's all fornication in the Bible. That's why that word is used. That every one of you, every one, not one should be lacking of knowing how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. It's an honorable thing to be a Christian. It's an honorable thing to live right before God. It feels good. It doesn't feel bad. It's not drudgery and pain and suffering. It's joy and righteousness and peace in the Holy Ghost. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. They've turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness in this time we live. And they allow all sorts of things that God does not allow. They take away from the Word of God and they add to the Word of God. And then it goes on down there and says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. God didn't call you and choose you and save you so that you can be an unclean, dirty, brute beast and look just like the world. He didn't do that. That's your flesh that wants you to do that. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. There's enough right there in one verse to nail you. Be patient toward all men. To put up with all these lunatics that are sore vest. To admonish the heretic once and and then twice, and then reject him. Put up with it. Paul did. See that none render evil for evil on any man. Because someone does you evil, you're not to dish it back out to them. You're to let God give it to them. And He will in due season. But even follow, ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. You give thanks for the calamities as well as the joys. You give thanks for the curses as well as the blessings. Pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean that you're supposed to be praying while you're asleep because you can't do that. It doesn't mean you're able to pray with your mouth when you're chewing food. You can pray inwardly many times when you cannot pray outwardly, so to speak. But as you have the ability and the opportunity, you are to pray. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You're supposed to give thanks when you wake up and you're sick. You're supposed to give thanks when you have a blemish or a spot on your face. Or a new wrinkle, a new crow's foot on your eyes, ladies. You're supposed to give thanks for aging to remind you that you're going to die and prepare you for the judgment. You're supposed to give thanks for your sore and painful back, for, for, for your lack of finances. You're supposed to give thanks for the troubles and griefs and sorrows. You say, well, you don't do that all the time. Well, neither do you. <laughs> well, we're, that's what we're supposed to do. See? Well, there's just a multitudinous list in the New Testament of ways we are to live. There are so many things told us. Uh, we're to be diligent. We're to be busy abounding in the work of the Lord. 
We're to do whatever we do unto God, not unto men. We're to serve God in trembling and fearfulness of heart, knowing the judgment that we're going to face. Now, there's a, there's a two ways I've already shown. There's a third way that men hurt themselves with the Bible. You know, the Bible is the most dangerous book in the world. There's no better thing to hurt yourself with than a Bible. Because people that hurt themselves with the Bible do themselves eternal hurt. Now, 2 Peter 3 and verse 15, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. There are some things in the Pauline epistles that are hard to be understood. They're not easy to understand. They're hard. Does that mean you're exempted from them? No. Did Jesus say things that were called hard sayings? This is a hard saying. Who can receive it? You know, he, There are hard things in the Bible, but you're not exempted from them. You're told to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It's a, you know, people are just lazy, they're indolent, they're stupid, they're froward, they're ignorant, and they don't want to learn. They don't want to work. Look, God ordained work because of sin. And when we cease to have sin in us, we'll cease to have to work. You see, as soon as sin entered in, work showed up. They could just hang out naked, and they didn't even know they was naked. It wasn't sin for them to be naked and eat. And look at all the pretty flowers and the pretty trees and the neat animals and have a good time. Now that's what every freak in the world wants to do right now. They want to hang out naked, eat, live in a garden, eat for free, sleep for free, never have any bad weather, and just have a big old time. And the one thing they don't want that was in the garden was God. Because God came down in the cool of the day and communed with the man and the woman. And they didn't want that. They want everything that God gives without God Himself. So today, the Americans want church without Christ. They want church without Christ. They have church without a Bible. That's what they do. You know, all you've got to do is bring in an ASV, and you can have church without Christ. You bring in an NIV, you can have church without Christ. That's what the queers are doing today. Down there at the Metropolitan Community Church, they're having church without Christ. They have an NIV in there. They hate the King James. Why? Because this book is a dirty book to them, because this book... Dirty book talks about their dirty sins. This book is the only holy thing on the face of the earth, and they hate it. They think what is clean is dirty. See, everything is upside down to the queers. So the holy book is an unholy book. And then an unholy book is a holy book to them. And they diminish from the Word of God, and they add to the words of God, and they're under the curse. So as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do the, also the other scriptures, onto their own destruction. I've always marveled that Peter called Paul's writing scripture while they were both still alive. Amen. That's just blown me away. Amen. He acknowledged that Paul's epistles were scripture. The letters that Paul wrote were scripture. You talk about being uh, puffed up, man. Well, what nerve did he have to say a man that was alive, when he was alive, was writing Scripture? None of those brethren would receive that now that we have today. Look, if Paul and Peter were here, they'd hate them just as much as they do you and I. Actually, a lot more. They wouldn't let them preach in their churches. They're disqualified. They had hair on their faces. Yeah, after all, you know, they weren't clean-shaven. They weren't good ministerial candidates. Paul had been a persecutor and injurious. He was educated at the wrong seminary early on in his life. There was no way of straightening him out. He was a stickler for the Bible. He would have been rejected because he believed everything written in the Law and the Prophets. They couldn't have that. He didn't have verses. He, he doesn't say, okay, up on Mars Hill, now I'm going to preach to you the, Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead, and uh, a better reading on this section of Old Testament would be, he never did that one time. They reject him. See? He wouldn't submit to the powers that be in the local university. So he was unfit. Well, any man that will follow God will be unfit for this world. He's being fitted for heaven, not for the world. Um, so they rest or twist the Word of God. Now, what does that mean? That means they have the Word of God, and instead of taking the bare words out or adding words to it, they twist or rest the meaning. They remove from the Word of God its right and true sense and make application of a verse 
that's not to be made. They have not studied to show themselves approved on a God of work, and they not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So they twist the meaning. You know, um, I've seen this. Well, this is done universally. It's just done universally, like, uh, like Rome does in Matthew 16. Uh, Thou art Peter, and uh, upon thee I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Upon this rock I will build my church. They make Peter the rock. It's not. See, they twist the sense. And when the Lord said, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. They twist the meaning, the sense of it, and say he literally becomes present in a Girl Scout cookie after a priest prays over it. That it's the literal flesh of God. Yeah. Yeah, which is... And then they say that they literally pray and that priest is drinking blood. Now, the consumption of blood is forbidden, forbidden in every dispensation in the Bible, everywhere in the Bible, in the Old and New Testament. So they prove by their deeds that they're not men of God. They rest the sense and cause the Bible to say something that it does not say. They falsely interpret. So you start hearing that word interpret, you better look out too. Now, second thing these men do is they add to the Word of God precepts of men as necessary to salvation. This is what was going on in Acts 15. Look at Acts 15, 24. Acts 15, 41. They, Judaizers, said, you must, keep, you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses so that you can maintain salvation. Now, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ gave no such commandment. And this was a grievous thing. See, verse 5, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. No New Testament apostle ever did that. He didn't tell them they had to be circumcised. And Timothy got circumcised. It didn't do him any good. You see? And also, verse 24. This is what they said, the apostles. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. When you... See... According to the book of Galatians 1.14, after the sacrifice of Christ and His resurrection from the dead, Old Testament religion, Paul called it Jews' religion. He called it Jews' religion. There was no longer a spiritual presence of God and all that stuff. The types were done away with because He that was typified came. So it's all done away with in Christ. So these men were taking what used to be ordained of God, but was no longer ordained of God, and it had become a man's religion, and it was no longer the religion of God. It was Jews' religion. And they put that on people, so they diminished from the sufficiency of Christ. They took away from the finished work of Christ. And then they added men's works as necessary unto salvation. They're wicked and sinful and hellish. And this is what every stripe of heretic does. They add to the Word of God precepts of men as necessary to salvation. If you're going to be a soul winner, you have to wear a white shirt and a black tie. You better have a real short haircut. And you can have a pretty good gut on you too. You know, I'd have to get a bigger one to really qualify. Yeah, I would. My, my gut would really have to protrude out. I'd have to have one like that. And then you kind of lumber around on Thursday nights. And you've got to knock on doors to be a man of God. Yeah, you've got to go from house to house every day, passing out tracks seven days a week, or you're not a man of God. Stuff that in your ear and your nose, but don't put it in your stomach. You see, that's garbage. That's adding to the Word of God. Soul winning isn't a thing. It's the only thing. You've got to be a soul winner. You've got to go out winning souls. Hallelujah. You've got to cry and weep over souls. Forget about crying and weeping over how people treat God. You can just cry and weep over those poor sinners going to hell. Look, God wants them to go to hell. They're going to get there no matter what you do. That's right. You say, you don't want to win souls, Brother Turner. You're sick in the head. No. That's not true. I want Christ to win souls, and He does it through His Word. That's right. It's not my job, it's His. I'm just to preach the gospel and let the chips fall where they may. I don't care. No, oh, but it's your responsibility. Where in the Bible does it say that? What tells you to pull them out of the fire? I can't pull them out of the fire except God moving me to do it. People, they're sick in the head. They're mentally ill. They're warped. They're perverts. They are perverts. They're perverted, as Archie Bunker said. You know, there's a lot of things Archie Bunker said that was true. I, I see. I was raised on pig swill, on foolishness and stupidity, and they always made fun of that guy because a lot of the things he said was right. 
He said the way to stop hijacking is give everybody on board a gun. That makes sense to me. So what do they do now? They take away the guns from the pilots. No, you can't. You know, we don't want you to be armed. So if some Arab comes up there and wants to fly your plane, you can blow his brains out and then land. Oh, no, we couldn't do that because he's supposed to love all men. See, it's universal charity. It's all universal junk. But on 2 Timothy 2, 15 and, uh, through 19. Uh, yeah, 2 Timothy. I turn to 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2, 15. And we read a few instructions. Study to show thyself approved unto God. That word's been taken out of all the new versions. Study. The only command of study been removed. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat, as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. <clears throat> well, lastly, adding to the word, precepts and doctrines of men, <clears throat> what it does is <clears throat> it overthrows the truth of God. And causes men to believe lies. Now, in the Bible, Joshua, which is another way to say Jesus in the Bible, in verse 8, this is what he was commanded. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. You're supposed to think of the word of God, meditate upon it when you rise up, when you walk, and when you lie down and go to sleep. The word of God is to be continually upon your mind that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written there, and not part of it, all of it. Oh, yeah, but I've gone out soul winning. I, I, I went and prayed over my food. Some people's Christianity consists in praying over their meal. You know that? Observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, do you want to be prosperous? Do you want to have good success? For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. 